It is good to be in the house of the Lord, to be able to worship him, to study him and open up the treasure that we have in scripture. Uh, we are aware of our brothers and sisters throughout the, the globe this morning who do not have the, such a luxury, such a privilege, who, um, as the sun has made its journey across the globe, have been uh, worshiping in secret, very small groups of three and four uh, families who come together under the threat of persecution, the threat of their families, the, the, the welfare of their lives, their employment, because God is precious and God is valuable and Christ is precious and Christ is valuable and they have built their lives on the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, may we not squander this opportunity squander the pleasure of hearing your word proclaimed. Lord, may we work. May we work hard to listen. Lord, hard to listen to the words that are spoken, though flawed, though imperfect, the vessel. Lord, the words are inspired, and your Holy Spirit is at work and working, and may we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying for the name and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we continue through 1 Peter, we are already in the second chapter as we continue. Uh, we look back on 1 Peter 1 in review to catch everybody up, is the work of God in salvation. God the Father who is working, who has chosen, who has initiated a relationship with a people. With, as he uses the term, elect exiles. Elect exiles who have been brought into the family of God and given new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Those who are born again. We hear that, often hear that term, being born again. The work of the Spirit who initiates life in the heart of a dead soul, bringing that person to life and giving them spiritual eyes to see the beauty of Christ, spiritual tongues to taste the beauty of Christ, and spiritual hearts to beat with a passion for the Word of God and a passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He tells these people, these elect exiles who are living as strangers in a strange land, the world, the society, the values are not their own. But they are members and they are citizens of a society, citizens of a home that is yet over the horizon, that they will sometimes go, though for a little while they suffer in this world. Their Heavenly Father is working and their Heavenly Father is calling them home. He tells them at the end of chapter, chapter 1, four commands, four imperatives, four uh, calls to action to live in hope, to live in holiness, to live in fear, and to live in love. And then in, as chapter 2, you turn the page to chapter 2, he says, put away spiritual malice, or as the word, Greek word, kakia, or as I use the example, kaka, as we talk to our children, the, the malice, the, the bitterness, the, the dirtiness of sin, put that away, the slander, the malice, and long for the spiritual milk, which is God himself, who sustains and gives life to our soul. And then now we turn our attention, speaking to a people who have, are strangers in a strange land, but now have been brought into a community, into a spiritual home, into a spiritual temple that the Lord God, our Heavenly Father, is building. Building with a cornerstone and building with a people. And to that we turn our attention uh, that we would hear. If you have tasted, verse 3, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. He's speaking to people who have got a glimpse, who have got a taste, who have picked up the aroma of the knowledge of the Lord and it is sweet and is delectable and is desire, desiresome to them and they desire Christ. Because in the background of this passage, there are two houses. Two houses that are being built. The first house is a house that is a spiritual temple being built to the gods of this age by human hands. 
gods of this age, which are maybe reason or science, self, to our image, pleasure, tolerance, power, pride, things that the society cherishes and loves and builds their, their lives upon and focuses their concentration and makes their cause as they desire the things of this world, the gods of this world, the treasures of this world. These spiritual houses that are being built are, are places of worship, adoration, and sacrifice as people devote themselves to their cause. Their God, whether it's, you name it, you see the gods of the society when you walk on the beach, on the street, when you turn your TV on, when you go on the internet, they come, there are plenty, and they are a cornucopia of choices for you to worship. And our society are building spiritual houses to these gods. These gods may be the beach. These spiritual temples may be built at the beach at Everbank Field, at the local dive bar, the imaginary world of online. These spiritual houses may be at the country club, the comer, the local marina, the pier, at the happiest place on earth, Magic Kingdom, right? They may be temples of worship on the back porch or sitting reclined in your lazy boy. Spiritual houses of worship are being built all throughout our society. These are places where we seek pleasure. Spiritual houses of worship where we uh, have identity and pleasure. And these are spiritual houses that are being built. In the background, looming in the shadows, on a hill far away, there is another spiritual house that is being built. A spiritual house where the people have, resonate with the psalmist who says in Psalm 15, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold, he holds my lots. And as he continues, the psalmist says, You make known to me the paths of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures evermore. In this world, in society, in these temples that are being built, there is one temple that is not being fashioned by human hands, not being fashioned by human institutions and societies and the, the elements that society offers. There is a temple that is being built by God himself with a chief cornerstone that has been rejected by this world with elect exiles, people of this world themselves who have been rejected by this world who are being fit and formed and fastened into a temple of worship. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost where his people are formed and fashioned for his glory and for his worship. And he says, verse 4, as you come to him, as you people who are rejected by this world, who don't fit in, who don't have the same priorities and values and, and emphasis and that the, the world has, as you come to him, and he describes him, speaking specifically, him is Christ. As you come to Christ, and he describes him, a living stone rejected by men. These elect exiles, these people who do not fit in society, who are being marginalized and muted and set aside and considered crazy and fanatical and, and ostracized, are not alone in their rejection. Jesus Christ himself was rejected by men. And as elect exiles, people who have been pushed aside from society, as Christ. The living stone, the foundation of the spiritual house has been rejected himself. A stone rejected by men. Christ has been examined by this world. The true Christ, the Christ of scripture has been examined by the world and he has been rejected. Why? Why has he been rejected? He uh, uh, deemed unworthy, unsuitable for building a house of worship. Often there are many reasons that Christ is rejected. One of them is exclusivity. There's no possible way that you can believe that Christ is the only way, that there is no name given on him whereby we must be saved. That's not possible. There are so many other ways to go to heaven. Christ is one way. He's one highway, they say. But unfortunately, Scripture does not give that leniency, that wiggle room. Christ himself says, I am the way, the only way, the truth, and the life. And they inspect Jesus and they reject Jesus. 
And they cause, they, they, Christ becomes no longer the foundation of spiritual houses. He becomes a castaway, a, a stone of stumbling. There are those who examine Christ and reject Christ because of their expectations, who they believe God is. Because they have false understandings of God. They develop who God is from the media and from Twitter and Facebook and manipulative Facebook posts and pictures and uh, stories, though, TV shows, though maybe they may be moral, they are not based on the God of Scripture. The Jews themselves wanted a king to throw off the tyranny of the Roman Empire. What they got was a suffering servant who said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirits. The Jews wanted a king high and lifted up who would come and wage war on the Romans and throw them off and that the Israel would live in sovereignty. They got a suffering king who was nailed to a cross and their expectations of who the Messiah was, they rejected the stone. There are those as a rich young ruler who came to Jesus himself and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How often in our witnessing does that happen? Someone knocks, hey, by the way, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That was a softball question for Jesus, right? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. And it says, I've fulfilled the the Ten Commandments from my birth. He says, give up all that you have and follow me really to fulfill the greatest of the commandment, to love the Lord. And it says the rich young ruler walked away from Jesus downcast. Why? Because he had many possessions and that he was not willing to part with because Jesus was not his ultimate treasure and value. And the things of this world were too valuable for him. And his expectation of who the cornerstone would be, he rejected Christ and walked away sad. There are those who, for his exclusivity, because of expectations, but also because of authority. We want a non-threatening baby Jesus who sits in, sits in the manger and looks cute and makes us feel good around Christmas time, maybe brings us eggs at, at Easter and makes us feel good. The God of Scripture is one who seeks authority and says, deny yourself and follow me. And then there are those who reject Christ because they have no interest. They don't need a Savior if they do not have sin. And they reject Christ. They had found, examined Christ and found him lacking because their expectations and their exclusivity and the authority and the lack of a need of Christ, they rejected him and he became a stumbling block to them. Christ was rejected. The cornerstone was rejected. But also the people are rejected. These ex- uh, exile, elect exiles, as it says in verse 1, are rejected, verse 1 of chapter 1, because their cultural priorities, their desires, their loves are foreign to this world. We do not understand because f- Christ is foreign, because he's a different spiritual house that is being built. The rejected stone, the cornerstone, is made and fashioned and designed for a rejected people. Christ is rejected by the world. Christians are rejected by the world. But here's the joy of First Peter. Though Christ is rejected in them and put him in a place, the cornerstone, and he has not rejected his people, the people, the Christians, or he calls into fellowship, we have a cornerstone that is strong. And though we are foreigners to this world and society and priorities, We have a God and a Christ who empathizes and sympathizes with us. And he is the stone that is rejected, is chosen and precious in the sight of God. God is building a house. God is building a house of worship for himself, a place for his glory, a place for his honor, a place for his praise. And where does he start? Notice in chapter 2, verse 4, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, what? Chosen and precious. The cornerstone uh, for masons as they build a building is the first stone that is set on the foundation. And it's significant because all the stones that are built in a building will take their direction and they take their point and they will take their lead from the cornerstone. It is the most important brick stone of a building. 
Desert, and it determines the, the structure of the rest of the building. If you have a bad, wiggling uh, cornerstone, your building will be weak, and eventually when the storms come and the waters rise, your house will be weak and it will fall. But if your cornerstone is sure, your house will be strong, your house will be in alignment, and it will be true, and it will be strong, and it will be able to stand the test of time. Though Christ is a cornerstone that is redeemed, Rejected and we are living stones that are rejected. In the sight of God, our cornerstone is chosen and it is precious and it is true. He is alive. It also says it's a chosen pre- precious, but it says it's a living stone. If you, the people of First Peter, lived in modern day Turkey, and in modern day Turkey, in the city of Ephesus, there is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis, where you can still go and you can see the foundations and the columns that are still standing there, though in ruins. Those buildings, those structures are dead stones not alive. They're just rocks hewn out of a larger rock that are set there. They're dead. But we have a living cornerstone who is alive. And that living cornerstone gives life and hope and breath to all of the house and to all of the stones because Jesus is alive. He's living. As Hebrews says, uh, we have entered into the presence of the Father by a new and a living way. He is a higher standard of holiness that sets for his worship as he says on the temple or in the um, Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, Sermon on the Mount. And what he says on the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, do not lust, do not lie, but I say, and he ramps up the level of holiness because he is a living stone, he is alive and he's true, and he's setting the standard, the conduct for his house. And he is our only hope in life and death that our spiritual house will stand and be sure because it is not based upon our building and our fashioning and our stone. It is built on the surety, the object of our faith, which is sure, and that is the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Psalm 18, which I read this morning, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, precious and chosen in the sight of God, though rejected and foreign to the world. Jesus is precious and he is sweet and he is desirable and he is the source of eternal lasting satisfaction that the spiritual temples that we are building, that we constantly go and chase for pleasure and satisfaction, cannot give us. God is building a spiritual house of worship that has begun with Christ. Christ is the foundation. The gospel is the foundation. It is, Christ is our priority. Christ receives the highest honor. That is why as a gospel-loving church, we proclaim Jesus Christ. We exalt the name of Christ because he is precious, he is holy, he is true, and he is our only hope. There is no hope in any cornerstone, though the world has, looks at Christ and deems him unworthy to build anything on. God himself says, Jesus is true and he is strong and he is the only place that we can be sure that when the rains came down and the floods came up, he was sure and strong and holy. Verse 5, we have a cornerstone, a precious living cornerstone in the sight of God. But notice verse 5, you yourselves, Christ is our, our foundation, but you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The, the spiritual house is set by God. The foundation is Christ, but it is composed and it is built and it is formed and it is united by the people of God by those who have been chosen, who have been brought into the family of God, the children of our Heavenly Father. The spiritual house set by Christ, composed of the people of God. People, though though rejected by the world, are chosen by God to come and to be a family and to adopt it into the family of God. We are a spiritual temple. The people of God are a spiritual temple. How are we fashioned? We're not fashioned on our own. We're fashioned by the hand of God. 
picking us and calling us out of, this, out of darkness and forming us into a holy spiritual temple. To do what? As Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple? Not speaking to individual believers, though we individually are the temple of God, but speaking to the church as a whole, you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you. We collectively, as the people of God, as the church, not just Ocean Park, but those who love and cherish the gospel, are being built into a temple, a spiritual temple. That is why in our creed we say the holy universal church. The universal church that has been brought from all corners of society, all ages, ethnicities, um, uh, monetary worlds, experiences in education, male and female are being formed into the universal church to offer spiritual sacrifices and to worship our God. We are a house. We are a temple. We are a church designed and fashioned by the Father for worship. And then he continues, notice, he says, you yourselves like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to do what? To be a holy priesthood. In the Old Testament, there were a select group of priests. And all their duty was, day by day, the people would come to bring their sacrifice to the priest, and then the priest would go from their presence into the temple and offer their sacrifices. The people were separated by the courtyards, and they couldn't see, and they had to wonder, is my priest doing his job? Is he being faithful to bring my offering, my sacrifice, into the presence of God? But now in the New Testament, because of Christ as our cornerstone, there's a new relationship. We no longer have to sit in the courtyards and look and wonder and see the billowing smoke and smell the aroma of the sacrifices from a distance. We have been brought into the holy place to bring our sacrifices as a priest. And this is what makes us unique as, as Protestants, unique as Baptists. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. We don't go to a priest who brings our sacrifices. We don't bring our confession to a priest. We bring our confession to God himself because we have been called that we are a living temple to be a holy priesthood, that we are are been fashioned and formed into this temple to bring our worship and our offering to the Lord. All Christians serve God by offering up spiritual sacrifices. We don't need a priest any longer as the Old Testament. We have a great high priest in Jesus Christ who, enter, who calls us as priests under his authority to come into the presence of our Heavenly Father. What an honor and a joy that we can have confidence that we can go directly to the Father and he hears our prayers. Though at times we realize how small they are in the... Um, in the scope of eternity, in the scope of history, we have a Heavenly Father that calls us into His presence and He hears our little prayers in our rooms when we're all by ourselves and we cry out. Our Father hears our prayers because we are called to be spiritual priests, the priesthood of all believers. Christians are chosen for service. They're elected for worship. They're designed for praise. And notice as it continues, you yourselves are living stones into a spiritual house or temple or, or church to be a holy priesthood to do what? To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The question is, what are these spiritual sacrifices? Because we don't offer physical sacrifices any longer because Christ's body was sacrificed and brought an end to the need for the continual perpetual sacrifices. We offer spiritual sacrifices. Paul in Romans chapter 12 says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. How we live is a sacrifice. Hebrews, the author of Hebrews 13, 15 says, through him let us continue continually offer up sacrifices of praise to God. And this is the fruit of the lips is to acknowledge him. The, our speech, our singing, our, uh, the way that we praise the Lord are acts of spiritual worship. 
Philippians 4.18, Paul writes to the Philippians, says, I have received full payment, and more I am well supplied, having received from Epaphrodites the gift you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to the Lord. We use our money, we use our resources, we use our abilities as spiritual sacrifices. This is not just trying to drum up another offering, but it's telling you every aspect of our lives can be used as a spiritual offering to bring praise and to glory to God. How you uh, use your gifts and your abilities and your resources to help the brothers and sisters that are in need. Use those for God's glory. Not to build our own kingdoms, but seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and on his righteousness and what? And all these things will be added unto you. The things of this world that weigh us down. Paying, we're uh, paying the mortgage and paying the bills and health care and all those things. The Lord will take care of that if we use our resources wisely and for his glory. And he continues in, in Hebrews 13. He, the author says, Do not ne neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. It's not just merely a ritual of we go and we offer a sacrifice and we say a prayer and then we leave and we're good for another five days. But it's a continual offering of sacrifices. We have all been called into the house of God to bring pleasing sacri spiritual sacrifices as priests. Those whose faith is in Christ who believe in the gospel, you are a priest. I bet you didn't know that. Some of you probably didn't know that. You're a priest. You, and that's what significance of our understanding that the pastor and the deacons are not spiritually elevated above you, that you have to kiss my rings when you come into my presence and call me honorable brother, father, Chris. But we are equal. We're at the same level. That we all together are a part of a spiritual house. We're a spiritual priest who bring in the ordinary means of life offerings and sacrifices. Whatever you do, Paul tells the Colossians, whether in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord. What? Giving thanks to God the Father through Him. How you sing. How you read a book, how you fish, how you turn a wrench, how you hit a baseball, how you care for your children, how you parent, how you cook a meal, how you lay a floor or paint a wall, how you teach your children, how you go to your job and sit at a desk and calculate numbers all day. All of that is used as a spiritual act of worship when you say, I am going to be the best mechanic and the best CPA and the best teacher, the best mother, father, husband, all for for the glory and the praise of my Father in heaven, that he may be glorified in how I live. And that what that does, that empowers ordinary lives. You don't have to sell all your possessions and move to a remote part of Africa, though that is honorable and that is needed and we desire. You can bring spiritual sacrifices by going to your job tomorrow morning and doing the best possible job that you can by being the best spouse, parent, child, uh, mother, father to your children to glorify God. We all offer spiritual sacrifices to the glory of God. God has called us to himself, to worship himself, to magnify God. How do we do this? We live in hope. Chapter 1 tells us we live in holiness. We live in fear. We live in love. And it's important to understand we're a spiritual house, a spiritual temple, a spiritual church that's being built. We don't do this in isolation. Living stones that are building a temple cannot be left alone. A, a stone does nothing when it's laying in the middle of a field, but when it's brought together and united together and in covenant with one another, that it functions and it uses its strength and ability to build up the, the top stones and the bottom stones and the stones to its left and its right to offer and function together as a community. You can't give proper sacrifices if you neglect the pre Teaching and the teaching of the word. God has given people in this church the ability to teach and lead and to shepherd and to love and to courage and to pray. We can't do that on our own. Because not only that, you are not receiving the gifts and the blessings that God has in, given this church. But when you are by yourself or walking on the beach and worshiping, 
week after week and month after month, you are robbing the spiritual house of God of the gift that God has imparted into your life. And brothers and sisters need the gift that you have been imparted with. And you need their gift so that we can be built up and strengthened and built on Christ and offer the, the sacrifices of, play, of praise. Our focus must be on Christ. Our focus is not on gifts, on functions, on visions, on attendance, on music, on liturgy, on PowerPoints, on emotions, and on times. Our focus must be on Christ. Our focus must be on the gospel. Honoring God by lifting high the name of Christ, magnifying and proclaiming the gospel that the, the believers are equipped and the lost are reached. Sands in Scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone a chosen and precious cornerstone. Whoever believes in, it, in him will not be put to shame, even though we endure shame for a little while in this world. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's a cornerstone for one house, but for the other houses of worship, it's a stone of stumbling, a rock of uh, offense. And the, and the end of chapter 8, or verse 8, it says they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And the beginning of verse 4 says, as you come to him. For those who have tasted Christ and you taste and see that the Lord is, is good, we come to him, we desire him, we are being built into a spiritual house and glorifying the name of the Lord because he, of, of the gospel, the work of the gospel. But there are those who reject and push away Christ and throw the cornerstone to the side. And they reach their destiny. And their destiny is fulfilled. Eternal damnation. The cost is great. The cost of rejecting the stone is great. And I pray, as the Spirit moves among us this morning, that you will taste and see that the Lord is good, that he is precious, and build your life on him day after day and put your faith in Jesus Christ because he is your only hope. Though we are at times so prone to the idols of this world, we see this through the Old Testament. There are a picture of us where the people of God, God had provided time and time again, yet they went and they followed the gods of Baal and Asherah and Molech and they offered their children to Molech. We so often are prone to wander I pray that we will cry out day after day, Lord, hold me fast to the rock of Jesus Christ. And may I not be like Herod and Pilate who rejected the cornerstone and they killed Christ and they fulfilled the plan of God to punish sin in their disobedience to their condemnation. And we are called to put our trust in Christ and in Christ alone because he is the only sure thing in this world. Though this world may reject Christ and reject us for following Christ, may we say, hold me fast unto the rock of my salvation. You are my only hope in life and death, shall we pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we need you. We need you because our hearts are weak. Our hearts desire acceptance, self-esteem. Our hearts are prideful. Lord, we need Christ. We need Christ to fashion and shape us and give us hearts to desire after Christ and to let go of the things of this world, let think the things of this world where we put our trust and build spiritual houses that will not fall and it will fade over time and crumble when the winds blow, when the storms come and the waters rise. The rock of Jesus Christ is our only sure hope in life and death. And I pray that we will cling fast to the rock for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ from day to day in our ordinary lives. May we praise the rock by offering spiritual sacrifices to the glory of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.